بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين Today's session is going to be about a very important uh, ayah from the Quran It's Ayatul Kursi Ayatul Kursi uh, as a Sheikh Al-Sa'di may Allah have mercy on him said was given this name because it addressed or in, uh, included uh, talking about the kursi of Allah Azza wa Jalla and we'll come to explain that uh, later inshallah uh, it's part of Surah Al-Baqarah which is a Madanin Surah uh, and there is no authentic narration pertaining to the reason of uh, revelation of this verse let's get to the verse Allah Azza wa Jalla says Allah la ilaha illa huwa al-hayyu al-qayyum لا تأخذه سنة ولا نوم له ما في السماوات وما في الأرض من ذا الذي يشفع عنده إلا بإذنه يعلم ما بين أيديهم وما خلفهم ولا يحيطون بشيء من علمه إلا بما شاء وسع كرسيه السماوات والأرض ولا يؤوده حفظهما وهو العلي العظيم each word of this verse, and I'll translate it now, is magnificent by itself. It's, it's amazing by itself. This, this, this verse deserves to be the greatest verse in the Quran. Allah, there is none worthy of worship except Him. The ever-living, the sustainer of all existence. Neither drowsiness overtakes Him nor sleep. To him belongs whatever is in the heavens and whatever is on the earth. Who is it that can intercede with him except by his permission? He knows what is presently before them and what will be after them. And they encompass not a thing of his knowledge except by his will. His kursi extends over the heavens and uh, the earth and uh, their preservation the heavens and the earth that is tires him not and he is the most high the most great the most noble science in islam is the science that's related to the Quran because the Quran is simply the words of Allah Azza wa Jal. and that's where it draws its greatness and honor and within the Quran any ayah that talks about Allah Azza wa Jal is greater than other ayat more honorable than other ayat they're all honorable they're all great but we're talking about which is better than or more uh, honorable than the other. The, ayah, the Ayatul Kursi addressed the aspect of Tawheed, monotheism, Islamic monotheism. And it also touched upon some of the qualities of Allah Azza wa Jal. The Prophet Sallallahu and this is reported by Muslim, uh, spoke to Ubay ibn Ka'b and Ubay ibn Ka'b as we've mentioned in previous uh, sessions uh, in the tafsir classes Ubay ibn Ka'b was one of those uh, who memorized the Quran and one of those whom the Prophet ﷺ said learn the Quran from him he mentioned four and one of them was Ubay ibn Ka'b Ubay said one day the Prophet ﷺ oh Abu al-Mundir do you know which verse from the book of Allah that you memorize is the greatest. So out of humbleness and politeness, he said, Allah wa Rasuluhu a'lam. Radiallahu anhu. He knows, but out of politeness, he said, Allah wa Rasuluhu a'lam. So the Prophet والسلام, asked him again, Ya Abu al-Mundir, O oh, Abu al-Mundir, this is his nickname. Do you know which verse of the book of Allah that you memorize is the greatest? He said, 
Allah la ilaha illa huwa al hayyu al qayyum. He knew that the Prophet sallallahu wanted an answer now. Because the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam as as a way of teaching the companions radiyallahu anhum at times he would introduce the topic by a question. And in many cases the companions actually did not know the answer. And in some cases like this he knew the answer but it's out of politeness he don't want he didn't want to to give something because the prophet sallallahu could have been intending something else but when he saw that the prophet sallallahu persisted on the same question he decided to say what he knew he said allahu la ilaha illa huwa al hayyu al qayyum ayat al kursi so the prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam that his chest radiyallahu anhu and he said May Allah Azza wa Jal facilitate knowledge for you. Scholars said this indicated the depth of his knowledge. Radiyallahu anhu. The ayah starts with Allah. Allahu la ilaha illahu al-hayyqub. So the first word in the ayah is Allah. The greatest name. The name which no one is allowed to take or use as a name to himself. It is because the verse is talking about Allah. It is a brief introduction telling people, introducing Allah, enlightening people about Allah. So it started with Allah. The second after that, the phrase that comes immediately after that, لا إله إلا هو. Allahu, لا إله إلا هو. Right? What is لا إله إلا هو? It is this, the first half of the testimony of faith. It is Islamic monotheism. It is bearing witness that none is worthy of worship but Allah. It is divinity exclusive to Allah. Servitude exclusive to Allah. You see where it's drawing its greatness. This verse. You see where it is drawing its nobility and honor. It is talking about the essence of our creation. We're created to be slaves. And it is addressing the very topic in the first uh, phrase or term right after the word or the name Allah. So Allah Azza wa Jal in this phrase is negating divinity from anything else and making it exclusive to himself none is worthy of worship but meaning only him and none but him others are worshipped yes but they're not worthy of that worship people worship idols yes worship whatever other things yes trees stars humans yes but they are not deserving of this. And Allah alone is deserving and worthy of that worship. Now, when you know that Allah Azza wa is the only one worthy of worship, what is the implication of this? So He is the only one you turn to, you seek refuge in, you supplicate. You ask for help. You weep too. You intend your acts of worship for. And so on and so forth. Then after this, Allah Azza wa Jal gave some of the distinct qualities that make him stand out compared to these false deities that are worshipped beside him. Subhanahu wa ta'ala. He said, Al-Hayyu al qayyum the everlasting, the sustainer of all existence. And he started with Al-Hayy. Because this is one of the greatest differences between Allah, the Almighty, and all other deities that are being worshipped. All gods that are worshipped besides, worshipped besides Allah Azza wa Jal. Al-Hayy, the everlasting. Everything else vanishes. Everything else comes to an end, come to an end. All will come to an end, all will die, all will vanish. But Allah is everlasting. 
and al hay entails that he existed before anything existed and will continue to exist subhanahu wa ta'ala his life is not bounded by boundaries it's not limited it was not preceded by a non-existent state nor will it come to an end al qayyum now some living things or people or may need assistance to do things right so okay Allah is ever living they're alive now so they might argue we're alive or our gods are alive but Allah besides being al hay he is al qayyum he is the sustainer of, of everything that exists he is self-sufficient, a samad. He doesn't need anyone. And everything and everyone else is in need of him. But Allah is not. So he again has this distinct quality. Al-Qayyum, Al-Qayyumiyya. Sustaining and maintaining his creation. Subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now these two qualities, Al-Hay and Al-Qayyum include under them as a general or a large umbrella everything else from his qualities and names being uh, ever living entails that he is samir he hear, he's all hearing uh, all seeing he speaks subhanahu wa ta'ala and being al qayyum entails that he is of all things capable that he is all knowledgeable all wise and so on and so forth allah azza wa says أَفَمَنْ هُوَ قَائِمٌ عَلَىٰ كُلِّ نَفْسٍ بِمَا كَسَبَتْ Is he who is a maintainer over every soul knowing what it has earned like any other? How can anyone compare Allah Azza wa to anything or anyone else? While he is Al-Qayyum. Allah la ilaha illa huwa al hayyu al qayyum. Okay, so he's ever living and he is sustaining and maintaining his creation and runs the affairs of this universe. La ta'khuduhu sinatu wa la nawm. Someone who is, and to Allah belongs the loftiest examples. Someone who's working round the clock will come to a time where he becomes tired, becomes exhausted. So to negate this, he says, لا تأخذه سنة ولا نوم. He's not overtaken by drowsiness. But someone might think, okay, so he doesn't become drowsy because perhaps maybe he slept and that's why he's not drowsy. Allah says, وَلَا نَوْمْ Nor sleep. So if you're thinking that drowsiness was preceded by sleep and thus he doesn't feel drowsy, he doesn't sleep. Why? Because it goes against perfection. He cannot be someone who is qayyum all the time, running and managing and maintaining and then becomes tired and has to sleep. This is not a God who is a creator, who is perfect in all his qualities and attributes. Because this entails having to sleep or becoming drowsy, it means you're out of energy. And this is a deficiency. The Prophet wasallam said, and this is reported by an Imam Muslim, he said, إن الله لا ينام ولا ينبغي له أن ينام. Allah does not sleep, and it's not befitting for him to sleep. You see, this is what we're talking about. It's not befitting. It's not. It doesn't go with his him being the perfect in all his qualities and and attributes. سبحانه وتعالى. له ما في السماوات وما في الأرض. To him belongs whatever is 
in the heavens and whatever is on the earth. This phrase comes here so that people long to know more and learn more about their creator, the one whom they're worshipping. He owns. Belongs to him means he owns. He's in control. What he says goes. What he wants happens. Kun fayakun. This is the implication of him possessing control and owning whatever is in the heavens and whatever is on the earth. So he is Hay, Qayyum, La ta'khudhu sinatun, wa la naum. And he possesses Lahu ma fi samawati wa ma fi al-ard. And he started with Lahu ma fi samawati. Because it is high, more suitable to his, to him being the most high, subhanahu wa ta'ala. And Allah Azza wa Jal possesses and owns and controls everything else, not just the heavens and the earth. But the scholars said Allah Azza wa Jal mentioned these two in particular because this is where humans live and the speech of the Quran is addressing humans. So it's directly related to them so they can relate and reflect and ponder. Allah Azza wa Jal says, لِلَّهِ مُلْكُ السَّمَاوَاتِ وَالْأَرْضِ وَمَا فِيهِمْ To Allah belongs the dominion of the heavens and the earth and all that is in them. I want you to pause here and not limit your thinking to what you see in the UK, in the US, in the Gulf, in because what you see above you with regards to the heavens, the sky, is nothing compared to what is called the universe. These trillions of stars and galaxies after galaxies, it is infinity. This is how universe is defined scientifically. It is infinity. They do not know where it ends. They cannot perceive their knowledge. Did not reach that. So when Allah says He owns whatever is in the heavens, just pause and think, what is in the heavens? It is beyond perception. Allah Azza wa Jal then says, مَنْ ذَا الَّذِي يَشْفَعُ عِنْدَهُ إِلَّا بِإِذْنِهِ Who is it that can intercede with him except by his permission? Allah Azza wa Jal doesn't need a supporter and there is none like unto Allah Azza wa Jal. And he controls and possesses and owns and maintains and sustains all that is in the heavens and in the earth. And this greatness and might entails that no one would dare intercede except if Allah Azza wa Jal permits that. No one? No one. Not even Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Not even Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. In the... Uh, books of Al-Bukhari and Muslim. The long narration of intercession when the sun draws closer and people start suffering and they want an end to their suffering. That's long. 50,000 years is a lot of time. And that's just waiting for a count to start. So they get fed up and they decide to approach the prophets and messengers of Allah Azza wa Jal so they can intercede with Allah to start accountability. It's not intercession to go to Jannah, no. It's just to start the account. And it's a long hadith. They go start from the top and then everyone pushes to the one after him. Not nafsi, nafsi, myself, my own rescue. 
Allah is angry today in a way that he's never been before and never will be after. Go to other than me, go to this, go to that until they say, go to Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And he sallallahu alayhi wa sallam will say, Ana laha. I am for this. I'll do this. So he says, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, so I go to the throne of Allah and prostrate. And Allah azza wa jal will inspire me to praise him with such praises which no one was inspired with before. In another narration, he said, with such praises that I don't know now. Meaning, it will only happen that time. And he will continue to praise Allah Azza wa Jal until Allah Azza wa Jal will tell him, O oh Muhammad, irfa' ra'sak, raise your head. Sal tu'ta. Ask and you'll be given. Ishfa' tu shaffa'. Intercede and you will be permitted to intercede. So the Prophet ﷺ would say, Ya Rabbi, Ummati Ya Rabbi, Ummati Ya Rabbi, my followers, my Lord, my followers. This is his concern. This will be his concern. It was always his concern, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And it continues until that time, that critical time. Ummati Ya Rabb. How much do we appreciate this? That's a question each one of us needs to ask himself. How much do we really appreciate him saying, Ya Rabbi, Ummati Ya Rabbi? My followers, are we his followers? Or is it only when it is convenient that we become his followers? Only when it, it, when it coincides with what we like and we want to do that, become, that we become his followers. Otherwise, we're something else. We need to be sincere with ourselves between us and ourselves talk to yourself see how much are you of a true follower that will fall under this definition ya rab ummati ya rab my followers my lord i want to intercede for those my followers are we going to be deserving of that we ask allah to make us amongst Now, intercession on the Day of Judgment is only going to be to those who believe in the message of Tawheed. Whether they are people who committed a lot of sins or few sins. But as of polytheists, atheists, disbelievers in general, they will not get a share of that. As Allah Azza wa Jal says, فَمَا تَنْفَعُهُمْ شَفَاعَةُ الشَّافِعِينَ They will not benefit from the intercession of those who intercede because those who intercede with Allah will intercede only for those who believe. يَعْلَمُ مَا بَيْنَ أَيْدِيهِمْ وَمَا خَلْفَهُ He knows what is presently before them and what will be after them. For dominion and kingdom an ownership to be complete and perfect, it has to be accompanied with perfect knowledge. Uh, a king, again to Allah belongs the loftiest examples, uh, for him to be able to run his kingdom, he must be aware of what's going on, knows what is going on with his subjects, with the place, the territory under his kingdom in order to be able to run it in the best manner. Allah Azza wa Jal knows everything. And the following verse triggered something in my mind once I was uh, sitting with some brothers uh, in the garden and it was the fall season and my my eye caught my eye a, a, a leaf a dry leaf that fell from a pecan tree and it was swinging 
going left and going right. The wind blows it this way and takes it this way until it landed in a spot. I remembered this following verse. وَيَعْلَمُ مَا فِي الْبَرِّ وَالْبَحْرِ وَمَا تَسْقُطُ مِنْ وَرَقَةٍ إِلَّا يَعْلَمُهَا وَلَا حَبَّةٍ فِي ظُلْمَاتِ الْأَرْضِ وَلَا رَطْبٍ وَلَا يَابِسٍ إِلَّا فِي كِتَابٍ إِلَّا فِي كِتَابٍ مُبِينٍ This all-encompassing knowledge is astonishing. He knows what is on the land and in the sea. Again, don't be limited when you say sea or land to what's around you. Go deep in your thinking. What does this land have? Worms, insects, animals, trees, everything. And see, what are these seas and oceans? What do they have? You know that at a certain depth, I think I read once that the deepest they went in an ocean was like 11 kilometers deep. It's pitch dark. Fish there have light. This is the nature of... So just imagine what is it that is in there? How many... Creatures exist in that. It's beyond perception. Not a leaf falls, but he knows it. And this is what I told the brothers. I said, Subhanallah, this amongst trillions of leaves around the world fall in certain spots which Allah had decreed prior to their falling. And Allah encompasses in His knowledge all of that. Besides His, Him sustaining and maintaining and running and controlling everything else in this universe. Subhanallah. Besides Him knowing what you can see in your heart. Besides Him knowing this I movement when you're trying to do something or see something and you don't want people to notice that you're doing it, you know? Allah sees that. And no green is there within the darknesses of the earth and no moist or dry thing but that it is written in a clear record. يعلم ما بين أيديهم وما خلفهم ولا يحيطون بشيء من علمه إلا بما شاء And they encompass not a thing of his knowledge except for what he wills. A sign of a perfect kingdom and control is that no one possesses knowledge of any part of that except when you permit that, when you want that to happen. So, none of the creation of Allah Azza wa Jal reach any knowledge about anything, except when Allah Azza wa Jal wants them to do that. And we lived that and we see it in our practical life. How much science has advanced? Look, not too far ago, 50 years ago, how was... Where were people with, in terms of science and where are they now? When they first came with faxes, it was something that didn't make any sense. How can I put a paper here and someone gets it out in another continent? And then when internet came, some people lost their minds. What are you talking about? We had no mobile phones. The first mobile phone that came out was something that needed two people to carry it. Now it's something that you can lift with a, a tip of a finger. The memory, when you used, used to say the, the computers were uh, 256 or whatever, uh, 
353, what was, what was it? 250 something and yeah, 256 and then 356 and then, wow. I still remember when I was studying computer science in the university, the, the uh, computer lab was like something like as huge as a basketball field. And the chip that is now a mini chip was something like, I don't know, maybe 10 refrigerators together. And it didn't have the capacity that this mini... The point here is that where was this knowledge 30 years ago? So no one can acquire anything, learn anything, except by the will of Allah Azza wa Jal. As Allah Azza wa Jal says, عَالِمُ الْغَيْبِ فَلَا يُظْهِرُ عَلَىٰ غَيْبِهِ أَحَدًا the, He is the knower of the unseen. He does not allow anyone to know any of it. Any of the unknown. إِلَّا مَنْ اِرْتَضَى مِنْ رَسُولِ Except a messenger, Allah Azza wa Jal, wants him to know, so he will allow him to know some of the ghayb. Like he informed Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam of things that happened before he was ever born and things that will happen after his death until the day of judgment. This type of knowledge. Now, today's science is considered something of the unknown, unseen 30 years ago, 50 years ago, 100 years ago. This is knowledge that is of the unknown and unseen. And then Allah Azza wa Jal, to further prove that He alone is deserving, Allahu la ilaha illahu. That he alone is deserving to be worshipped. So he mentions one of his creation that is related to him. Al-Kursi. Wasi'a kursiyuhu samawati wal ard. His kursi extends over the heavens and the earth. Now this kursi was defined by Ibn Abbas. He said, but be careful when you hear qualities of Allah Azza wa Jal. Don't hasten to think about things that are similar in name with what you see in this life and start visualizing it to be that attribute of Allah. So when Allah Azza wa when we say Allah has a hand, don't look at your hand and start imagining that this is like the hand of Allah, for example. When Ibn Abbas said, the kursi of Allah is the spot where the feet belong or will be sitting or be set. So don't think that it's a stool like a stool we have and feet. No, no, no. Allah Azza wa Jal's qualities are something that befit His Majesty. There is nothing like Allah Azza wa Jal. So be careful and restrict your uh, understanding to the text as it is without imagining and resembling and giving similitude. Uh, in the book of uh, Ibn Hibban, and it's classified as authentic by Al-Albani, the Prophet wasallam said, and this is for us to try to understand the greatness of this Al-Kursi which will re reflect the greatness of Allah Azza wa Jal. He said, the seven heavens and in another narration and the earth when compared to the Kursi are like a small ring thrown in the middle of an open desert. Al-Ard al-Fala. Fala means a desert that has no end in any direction. It's endless. So, imagine a small ring thrown in the middle of this vast land that's endless. 
What does it represent? Nothing. The Prophet ﷺ said, the seven heavens and the earth, when compared to the kursi, are nothing. There's another narration the Prophet ﷺ described the seven heavens. He said the same, he gave the same similitude. He said the first one compared, the safe first heaven compared to the second is like a ring thrown in an open land that is endless. The second is in the third and the third until he reached the... So now you can imagine the, the size of these heavens, right? All of them collectively, when compared to the kursi, are again like a, an insignificant thing. That's close to or non-existence. And then, he said, and the throne of Allah, when compared to the kursi, is likewise. So now, I want you to go from down up. Earth, heaven one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, all of these compared to the kursi, and then the kursi compared to the harsh. And none of that is something that will reflect what Allah's glory and might is, but it's something to bring to the mind some close, something closer so you can visualize what are we talking about? This is, this is so magnificent. This is so great. And Allah makes mention of this kursi. And with these religious texts, the, the prophetic narrations, so he will make people uh, submit in servitude to him. Subhanahu wa ta'ala. وَلَا يَعُودُهُ حِفْظُهُمَا See these heavens and how they were described and the earth. Allah Azza wa Jal maintaining these and preserving these seven heavens and earth does not tire him. He does not become exhausted or tired preserving and maintaining them. If anyone else took control, as Allah Azza wa Jal said, if anyone else would take control, they would have collapsed. إِنَّ اللَّهَ وَيُمْسِكُ السَّمَاءَ أَنْ تَقَعَ عَلَى الْأَرْضِ إِلَّا بِإِذْنِهِ He keeps the sky from falling down on the earth except by his permission. وَهُوَ الْعَلِيُّ الْعَظِيمُ And he is the most high, the most great. Again, Allah concluded the verse with two of uh, his qualities, subhanahu wa ta'ala. That despite the, him being the most high, he still preserves and maintains and sustains and runs and controls. So he confirmed these two qualities, being the most high and the most great. With this we will conclude the uh, tafsir of, of the ayah.